Of all the thousands of planets we've discovered so far, the Earth stands unique. It's brimming with life. As an oasis of life punctuating the lifeless expanse of space, the Earth is the only truly habitable planet that we know of. But what does it mean to be habitable? Broadly speaking, a planet is habitable if it has conditions that can support life. Since we only know of life on Earth, our conditions for habitability look an awful lot like the conditions of Earth. Generally, when astronomers talk about habitability of planets, the fable of Goldilocks and the Three Bears comes up. In this fable, Goldilocks comes across three porridge bowls belonging to a family of three bears. Goldilocks found one bowl to be too hot, the second too cold, and the last was just the right temperature. Now, aside from being a touching story of home invasion, this idea of temperature being just right forms the basis of our understanding for habitability. If a planet is too hot, complex molecules like DNA could break down, but if a planet is too cold, then there wouldn't be enough energy to jumpstart the chemical reactions necessary for life. So to be habitable, the surface temperature of a planet needs to be just right. In this case, just right means hot enough that water exists as a liquid, but cold enough that it doesn't boil. We have these conditions because water seems ideal for life. Pretty much everywhere we find liquid water on Earth, we find life. It acts as a kind of stage for the symphony of life to play out. To first order, the temperature of a planet depends on its distance from the sun. The greater the distance, the cooler the planet. And this is just to do with how much starlight falls onto the planet. So, if an astronomer knows how bright a star is, they can calculate how far away a planet needs to be to have just the right temperature. The range of distances that would let planets have just the right temperature is known as the Goldilocks zone, which forms a ring around the star. In our solar system, unsurprisingly, the Earth sits nicely within the Goldilocks zone, we did, after all, use the Earth as our example for habitability. But it also looks like Venus is just on the inner edge of the Goldilocks zone. And on the opposite side, Mars also sneaks into the outer edge of the Goldilocks zone. So the Goldilocks idea says we should have three habitable planets in our solar system. But is this really true? Sadly, no. The surface of Venus is a hellish landscape with scorching 500 degrees Celsius surface temperatures, and Mars is a frozen world with surface temperatures around minus 62 degrees Celsius. So clearly, habitability is a bit more complicated. Although Venus, Earth, and Mars are all in the habitable zone, they're all very different in one crucial way, their atmospheres. You see, if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, the surface temperature would only be around minus 18 degrees Celsius, which is too cold for liquid water. But with our atmosphere, the Earth is able to trap energy from the sun using molecules called greenhouse gases. This greenhouse gas effect of an Earth-like atmosphere is actually incorporated into the Goldilocks zone calculations. But not everything is Earth-like. The atmosphere of Venus is many times denser than the Earth's, and it's mostly made of greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse effect has turned a potentially habitable Venus into a dangerous oven planet that is uninhabitable, excluding perhaps the upper Venusian atmosphere. Mars is the opposite. It lost its atmosphere to solar winds long ago, leaving it with virtually no greenhouse effect. To retain the sun's energy. So we've lost two potentially habitable worlds just due to the atmosphere. So it's clear that the Goldilocks zone isn't the full answer to the question of if a planet is habitable. There are many other factors that come into play, and understanding these factors gives us an idea of how many oases of life could exist in the universe. We've already talked about temperature and how the atmosphere plays a key role in that. So if we want a habitable planet, we need to have an atmosphere and the gravity to hold on to it. 
We believe that Mars once had, perhaps, a very Earth-like atmosphere, but it was blown all away. The problem was that Mars is simply too small, and its gravity too weak to stop the Sun blowing away the atmosphere with its solar winds over the course of billions of years. Closer to home, we can see the importance of mass again with our Earth and Moon. The Earth has enough mass and therefore enough gravity to hold on to its atmosphere, whereas the Moon doesn't, and has no atmosphere. So to be habitable, a planet needs an atmosphere, and it needs to be massive enough to hold on to it. But it can't be too massive, otherwise it would hold on to too much atmosphere and become something like a mini-Neptune. So from just thinking about the atmosphere and doing some calculations, we can conclude that a habitable planet should have a mass somewhere between half and two times the mass of the Earth. In fact, it seems that a planet could be more habitable if it had a little bit more mass to hold on to a little bit more atmosphere. Now that we have an idea of how the atmosphere and mass contribute to habitability, let's look at the geophysics of the planet itself. Although volcanoes and earthquakes may seem hazardous to life, they are key for habitability. We can understand this by thinking about the global nutrient cycle. Suppose you have a planet abundant with the nutrients necessary for life, but no geophysical activity. Life may flourish on this world, making use of all the resources, but with each generation, the global resources are depleted just a little more. Over the course of millions of years, the previously abundant nutrients become scarce on the surface, and our habitable planet starts looking more uninhabitable with each generation. Eventually, life will have nothing left to use, despite the planet being filled with similar nutrients, just out of reach of life. This scenario could have played out on countless worlds, but it hasn't happened on Earth. On Earth, we have some incredibly interesting geophysical processes. To understand these processes, let's dive down into the Earth. Descending from the surface, we start with the crust, which is the stuff the land and ocean floors are made of. As we go deeper, temperatures and pressures rise until about 20 kilometers down, we come to a global ocean of molten rock called the mantle. This magma ocean extends for 3,000 kilometers from the crust to a zone made of liquid iron and nickel called the outer core. Going deeper still, the pressures become so great that the iron and nickel are forced to form a solid inner core, despite the scorching 6,000 degrees Celsius temperature. Since the core is hot and the crust is cool, the mantle next to the outer core is hotter and less dense than the mantle next to the crust. So just like boiling water, the hot mantle rises while the cold mantle sinks setting up great circulation patterns beneath the crust. As the mantle moves through these circulations, it drags and pulls on the crust, slowly moving the surface around. If the crust was all just one big piece of rock, this wouldn't matter too much. But the crust is broken into segments called tectonic plates, and the mantle moving makes the tectonic plates move. If two plates move away from each other, the mantle wells up to fill the gap, making new crust with new nutrients. But if two plates move into each other, then they collide. If a plate is pushed up, it can make mountains, but if another is pushed down, it disappears into the mantle. This process ensures that there's always a fresh supply of nutrients coming from the mantle to the surface. So unlike our geologically inactive, habitable planet, which soon ran out of resources, the Earth with its tectonic plates won't run out of resources. This means that for a planet to be habitable long term, it should have tectonic plates, or at least some volcanism. There's also one more advantage that geophysics gives Earth for habitability, and that comes from the iron core. Under the extreme conditions at the center of the Earth, 
the rotating iron core produces enormous magnetic fields. These fields shield Earth's surface from dangerous radiation coming from space and make the aurora borealis and australis. It may not be necessary for a habitable planet to have a magnetic field, but it certainly helps in retaining an atmosphere and protecting the molecules of life from their own sun. So far we can see that having an atmosphere and being geologically active are both key for a planet's long-term habitability. But a planet can only be habitable if and for as long as its star agrees. There could be a perfectly habitable world, it has a nice atmosphere, tectonic plates, water, and is the right distance from its star, but the star has reached the end of its life. This ideal world faces a catastrophe not of its own making. Its sun will grow rapidly over the course of a few million years, baking the planet's surface and potentially eating it entirely. The perfect world is habitable no more. The role of a star is critical for the habitability of a planet. For a world to be habitable long term, it needs to orbit a long living star. For stars, the more massive they are, the shorter they live for, with the shortest living only tens of millions of years. Stars like our sun will live for 10 billion years, which is good, but not great. A really small star could live for potentially trillions of years, which sounds fantastic until you find out that these tiny stars launch enormous flares which could quickly strip away the atmosphere of an unsuspecting habitable world. So the star can't be too big, and it ideally shouldn't be too small. The ideal star for a habitable world is probably a star just a little bit smaller than our sun. These stars could live for 20 to 70 billion years, certainly a good amount of time for life to call a habitable world home. The cool thing here is that our sun isn't even the optimal star for habitability, but we're still here and the earth should still be habitable for a while yet. So things don't need to be perfect for habitability and life, they just need to be good enough. There are some other factors which also aren't strictly necessary for habitability, but make things nicer. One of those nice additions is having a large moon, like our moon, to stabilize the planet's axis of rotation. With its gravitational pull, the moon keeps the Earth's rotation axis in check and gives us reliable seasons and days. Without a big moon, the tilt of a habitable planet's rotation axis could change drastically over time, creating chaotic variations in seasons and even plummeting an otherwise habitable world into extreme ice ages. Habitability is certainly a tricky idea to understand, made all the more difficult by having only the Earth as a reference for a habitable world. Likewise, we only have one occurrence of life to try and understand what conditions are optimal for any life form in the universe. Even with our limited understanding and data of distant worlds, a handful of exoplanets already look like they could be habitable. Perhaps some of them may even be more habitable than the Earth, though we don't know just yet. As our telescopes and analysis methods improve, I'm certain we'll find a truly habitable world in the near future. Though we may never visit the habitable worlds we discover, it will be a great comfort to me at least to know that there are other oases like the Earth scattered throughout the expanse of space. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. This video was inspired by a scientific paper led by Professor Dirk schultz maku which talks about what a planet would need to be super habitable, so more habitable than the Earth. It's a really interesting paper, so I do recommend checking it out if you're interested. 
I've left a link to the paper in the video description. Also a special thanks to Anne for suggesting this in the comments. If you have any questions about this topic or just want to talk about anything else science related, please leave a comment. I always enjoy seeing everyone's thoughts. But for now, thanks for watching.